Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here uh, in this young investigator meeting. And I think uh, for me, this is the first time I'm giving this kind of a lecture. So that way, I'm also kind of young presenter uh, who is giving a mentorial lecture. Because I, mean, I think it's I'm giving first time this kind of a lecture. Uh, so let's see how it's going to go, and uh, it's not going to be like one of the big uh, Star Wars lectures. So you have to cope up with whatever um, I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes. So by the way, Deepak, um, thanks for the nice words, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this place. And uh, for me, uh, whatever I learned, I mean, it was a nice opportunity uh, you know, to hear some of the things which I did not think. Uh, so I'll start with this because I thought it's very, very important. All the views and opinion expressed in this presentation are based on, purely based on uh, my personal views and the manner in which, you know, some extent things uh, proceed uh, in my laboratory. And these views are nowhere related to the policies of my department or my institute. I know that a lot of things what I'm going to tell, uh, there will be difference in the opinion. Okay, so please keep in mind and, and uh, see at this level, you know, you are all young investigators, you know, you are all grown up, mature enough to take whatever you want and, and uh, you know, rest of the thing. I mean, that's true for uh, you know, any one of us, like we are all that way grown up. You sound like you're from JNU. <laughs> <laughs> I have some JNU students, uh, so maybe they, their influence is a lot. Okay, do you think I'm uh, too political? Is that why? Okay. No, so see, the thing is, sometimes I frankly tell my opinion, and that can be completely <laughs> opposite to what someone else thinks. That's why I thought uh, it's kind of, even you know, institute, we can have sometimes issues. They may think, oh, why do you think like that? But then that's my opinion, right? Right. Okay, so since uh, it's a mentorial lecture, I thought I should uh, acknowledge my mentors. So this is where I did my uh, PhD, Banaras in the University, and Mercy Raman, she is a cytogenetist, and that's where I did my PhD, and in fact, that's the place where I learned, you know, I can tell preliminary lessons of my research. And then I moved to University of Southern California for uh, my postdoc studies. Uh, with Professor Michael Lieber, and in fact, that's where I, uh, you know, I have developed or I have learned a lot of things um, about, uh, you know, critically looking at the data and you know how to write a paper and many many such kind of things. I'm sure uh, many of you would have experienced similar kind of things. Uh, so as Deepak said, I joined uh, about ten years back. In fact. Um, I think it's there. 19th April 2006, in another one month, I'll be completing 10 years in IAC as an independent investigator. So, what I'm going to do today, and today's presentation essentially kind of divided into three aspects. First part, I'll talk about a lot of things I have learned during this 10 years. Um, and, and then the second half, I'll talk about one of the, one of the major findings from our laboratory. Uh, which, uh, in my opinion, uh, turned out as one of the, um, uh, you know, contributed significantly, significantly to the literature. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit, maybe last three to five minutes, I'll uh, try to give a few suggestions for young investigators, uh, and, uh, and that's where I'll end. So we'll ch start with challenges of a young investigator, like when I started my lab, what were the challenges in front of me? I mean, that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, so now when I look back, what I feel is, you know, the ch challenge this person facing and a young investigator facing, in my opinion, uh, this guy is doing, uh, you know, he's at uh, much more risk. So I have kind of categorized, there are some five, six points, in my opinion, uh, would become major challenge for a young investigator. The first is choice of the project, funding, managing students, publications, collaborations, collegial relations, and uh, so on. Uh, there are two major points which I did not include here, which is kind of intentionally. Um, see, one of those is like, you know, to have in-depth knowledge and things like this. But in my opinion, 
See, if you decide to choose this path at this juncture, you know, it's kind of expected you to have that. Otherwise, and you know, obviously, you are uh, you cannot be a uh, any sort of investigator. So I did not include that. And then another point I did not, I will not be talking about is the ethical issues. Um, that's very very important. There's no doubt about that. But again, uh, my take on that is, see, if you don't maintain your integrity, right, or uh, ethics in research, then that's the death of that research. So um, again, I'm not going to go into uh, that uh, to raise my presentation. So I'll go some of this point uh, one by one. Choice of the project. I think it's probably the most important thing. I mean, uh, the problem is there are many things which is going to come. I'm going to tell each one is very important. And you will also probably agree that they are all important. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think this is very important. Like, say, when uh, when I started my lab, I was thinking about you know like what kind of work or what would be my path forward. In fact, not when I started. Uh, maybe about two years before that, I started thinking about that. Because I'm sure you know that you know when we go for a presentation, you should be ready with uh, your uh, you know career plan or whatever next five year plan and things like that. Um, so, I, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, see, I categorize these projects as you know, no risk, less risk, you know, risky projects. Uh, the name itself says what it is. In my opinion, no risk is something where you know, an outcome is like guaranteed. In the sense, even if you get a positive result, negative result, it doesn't matter. It will be a, you know, it will be a finding. Um, I'm sure people may have questions. We can discuss you know, more detail about that probably uh, when if somebody have questions. Uh, and similarly, less risk. For example, uh, a, p a particular phenomenon is discovered in a model organism, and then you know you are interested in looking at another model organism. So where you have already enough background information. Uh, so I put those kind of projects as kind of less risk, but still there is a risk. Because uh, you know it might have bugged in uh, bacteria, but it may not be there in uh, you know higher order organism, and, you know vice versa, and so on. Uh, but the one which uh, could result in like new findings or groundbreaking result is uh, something I put it as the category of a risky project. Why it's risky? Uh, sometimes your hypothesis, obviously your hypothesis is based on preliminary data. There is no doubt about that. But even then, you don't know how it's going to go. Uh, it can go up to certain level, and after that, you may find everything stops, right? Now, I don't want to discourage anybody because, uh, in my opinion, one should go uh, with this. Uh, at least uh, in Indian scenario, say if I was an investigator in, uh, say, US, probably my strategy would have been different. Um, but what I decided to do was something like this, where I try to look at small projects, medium projects, and big discoveries. Generally, big discoveries, you need to understand, it takes a lot of time, and it. Then only you can, you know, you need to look at uh, a particular problem at different levels, and it's going to take a lot of time. Um, whereas small, medium can be much faster. So I kind of aimed at something like this, like this lady. Uh, but having said that, there are people who believe this is much more appropriate because that is the one which can contribute significantly uh, to science. Because you know, if you are uh, looking at identifying a new phenomenon, probably so these kind of projects can be helpful. So it's up to you to decide which way you want to move. Uh, my suggestion is uh, establish with a small fish and uh, then go for the big one. There is advantage uh, in that way, which we'll talk uh, a little more later. So now, when I started my lab, and these are some of the projects I th I thought uh, I should uh, initiate or start with. Now, how did I choose these projects? See, if you look at, this is something, uh, I don't know whether, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with chromosomal translocations. So these, these are nothing but chromosomal exchanges, you know, so aberrations. Um, see, during my postdoc, one of, I mean, in fact, the major project what I worked was to, uh, to understand how the chromosomes breaks during the translocation. What's the mechanism by which chromosome breaks? Is it something to do with, do with the, you know, the DNA sequence at the region where it breaks? Or uh, was it something to do with the uh, kind of proteins or um, you know, enzymes present in those cell types where such translocation takes place? Okay. So that was my postdoctoral projects. But then obviously when I started my lab, uh, I wanted to continue 
that project, but not exactly the kind of thing what I was doing. But you know, there are a lot of other things uh, related to that. Like for example, uh, I was interested in looking at like how a normal cells after getting this translocation will get transformed into cancerous. I mean, you know that you know there are a lot of secondary mutation, those kind of things. But those are when you say broadly. But if you look at carefully, there are still uh, you know nobody knows. Uh, like once a person, a normal person get a translocation in their body in one particular cell actually to start with and then later uh, you know they get, uh, not all, like a very less percent of the people may end up getting this cancer. So that was one of the projects we want to work with respect to that and then many such kind of things. The bottom line is uh, one of the projects or one of the area we started with have a connection with my postdoctoral studies. Now if you look at uh, maybe before that and then we started something independent where, where we tried to look at um, uh, the role of different DNA structures, different altered DNA structures. I'm sure you know that normally D DNA is in B form like you know duplex DNA, Watson Crick paired uh, hydrogen bonded DNA. Um, but then uh, recently people have shown that not only B DNA there are there could be other forms of DNA. There are again controversy related to that. Um, but I think it's coming increasingly evident that uh, uh, in addition to BDNA, there are other types of other forms of DNA. And then now what we are trying to look at is what is the contribution of these altered DNA structures with respect to different diseases, genetic diseases as well as cancer and so on. Now uh, third aspect of the or third line of research what we initiated had a connection with my PhD work which was on DNA repair, just uh, Deepak told. So we work on DNA. Uh, non-homologous end joining. I am sure some of you would have heard about this. This is one of the DNA double strand break repair pathways. You know, like when both the strands of DNA can uh, cut in a close vicinity, that's what is a double strand break. So, um, so there are different uh, repair machineries for that. One is called a homologous recombination and the other one is called NHEJ or non-homologous end joining. So, so uh, uh, part of my PhD work was actually focused on NHEJ. So I kind of continued with that line of research but asking newer questions um, where, wherein we were trying to look at you know what's the mechanism uh, in, of NHEJ in like say normal cells, cancer cells and then uh, um, what's the backup pathways like what is the protein missionaries and many such questions. Now this is something I thought we wanted to start new uh, wherein I did not have any expertise with respect to uh, uh, based on my PhD or postdoctoral studies. Um, we thought we will look for novel uh, anti-cancer molecules. So again there was a reason behind that, maybe later I can explain because time is also you know running forward. Uh, so, so here what we thought is we wanted to look for small molecule inhibitors either chemically synthesized or purified from plant and try, you know, trying to uh, look for its efficacy with respect to uh, killing cancer cells. Now like the second part what I am going to tell at that time in fact I am going to tell you a story wherein we combine both these things. We, we come up with a small molecule inhibitor which can be targeted against DNA repair and that happened to be you know some extent a blockbuster finding if I can call it that. I um, will come back to that. So now coming to the second challenge an, an investigator may face um, you know, once after identifying the project obviously is going to be the funding. Funding is you know, very important. You can have whatever nice project you um, can think and design but if you don't have sufficient money and infrastructure obviously you cannot execute. If you are a bioinformatician maybe you can some extent. You know you can have collaboration but at the end of the day you have to have some good funding. Okay? Now again when, if, when I go back to my uh, experience it was not very pleasant uh, but then it's okay that's how it is you know you have to take the life the way it comes I mean it's true for researcher as well. Um, so I got see I said 2006, 2006 April I joined in about 6-7 months I got my first DBT project which is a, obviously a decent project small decent project. Uh, so more or less same time I was also looking for uh, you know this welcome trust. At that time it was welcome. In fact it was the first year of DBT welcome. Um, so I tried but you know I went up to the last stage but I could not make it. Um, and I was very disappointed. Uh, keep in mind see all of us you know, when we go through this some of them will be successful some may not be. 
and the, each time when we are not successful, obviously, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not something we wanted. We will be extremely disappointed. I was also, but we cannot, uh, we cannot keep, you know, keep complaining about all your lifetime and say, oh, I did not get this because of that I could not do. So that's not going to uh, help any one of us, and including you know, each one of us. So the <laughs> the bottom line is, yeah, I tried a few big things. It did not happen. So my advice to you is don't get dejected. Um, if you are coming back to India, there are still there are plenty of opportunities. So that's what I did. Uh, I looked for small grants. So this, the problem with the small and big grant is, see if you, I mean, if you get, for example, a senior, I mean, not senior, I think intermediate DBT welcome fellowship now, I think it's about three or something like that crores, which is very good amount for a young investigator to start with. I'll tell you that. If you are able to get, uh, it's really good. But even if you don't get, like me, you can go to some of these funding agencies and they may not give you that big amount. You know, it may be much less than what you get from the bigger uh, places. But, uh, you know, you have the option to get multiple fundings. And that's what exactly I did. So, again, yeah, don't give up, right? And don't, uh, you can complain for some time. Because, you know, you always think that I did very well. Even I thought uh, in my interview I did very well. You know, but the fact is if you don't get, don't get. That's it. Uh, move on. Um, so what I did is, after that, you know, when you have this small, small grant, you know, you have to spend each penny more judiciously and otherwise also in my opinion. So I got funding uh, from multiple agencies. So that's how I survived uh, for all my nine years. Uh, but last year was very good for me, but I won't tell you what it was. <laughs> Maybe I can tell you in personal if you, somebody has a question. Uh, so that's how it goes. So now coming to the third point, which I, again I think probably is the most important thing. The reason is, even if you have good idea, lot of money, unless you have good students, you know, and whom you trust, they trust in you, you cannot progress. Because you may think, oh, during my postdoc PhD, I did excellent work, I published here, there, everything is fine. But you have only two hands, and you need to realize that, right? And you have to manage your students. I believe uh, this is kind of most important and, and probably most challenging for a young investigator. Because we are all different human beings, and that's why it's most challenging. Some of uh, you will have easy time, but some of you may have difficult time. So you need to see how much or you know, how far you can adjust yourself to take up this challenge, and which is going to uh, kind of have quite a bit of impact with respect to your success. Okay? And I believe that students are backbone of your laboratory, in my laboratory. Um, whatever I say, you are always you take it as mine because I'm just sharing my experience with you. And in my case, what happened was, see, first couple of years, I had two to three very good students. In fact, uh, this you know, these two to three good students at the early stage of your career could make a huge difference, and you will realize that. And each student, in my opinion, each student is special. And when you have multiple students, you just cannot compare one student with the other. Because the moment you started doing that, then there will be a problem. Because you know, your expectations are high, this guy is doing very good, other one is not doing. So that's create a problem. So please don't do that. Instead, uh, what you need to do, in my opinion, again, is uh, you know, don't compare. Instead, you know, try to take care of each, each one of them as an individual. And they are coming with you know, different background, different uh, kind of uh, um, you know, information or whatever. So please uh, keep that in mind. And whenever it's possible, always try to encourage students. See, research is such kind of a thing. Some, you know that you know, it's a lot of ups and downs. Right? Uh, so someday everything will work. There are days uh, you know, frustration. It's a, it's a part of the game. So we are frustrated. Sometimes students are also frustrated. So, so that's the time sometimes you know, your little bit of good words even things when it uh, not working can make a lot of difference with respect to that student, especially those that student's confidence. And try to be a mentor rather than simply a supervisor. That's very very important. And ensure the overall development of a student, uh, whomever is working with you. And then the moment they get that feeling uh, in their head, you know things are going to be much much better for not only any investigator for any any investigator. And if you look at um, you know, a lot of successful PIs around, be it in India or abroad, you will see you know, these, these are also the guys who managed their people very well. So that's quite important. 
So now there are some pictures. Uh, so this is when I started lab within six months. I have very small lab. And this is about a couple of years back. We have grown. We have quite a bit of people. And this is current lab. Um, uh, this may be a little too big. I don't advise to have, I mean, it's about 20 people. I mean, it's a little head, too much of a headache. And okay, as an young investigator, for sure, you should not uh, get into those kind of numbers. But even now, I'm trying to reduce. But you know, every day, I will tell. But effectively, it's not happening. There are reasons for that, if somebody wanted to know. Now, I, I talked about two, three people who made the difference in uh, you know, my career, like students. So she's Mridula Nambiar and Mrinal. So like two excellent PhD students. And I'm sure you all know that there's a big difference between India and uh, you know, abroad, particularly Europe and um, US. The difference is, in India, most of the you know, major research work is done by PhD students, not postdoc. Whereas uh, there, I think it's mostly postdoc and some extent PhD students too. But here, uh, generally, it's the other way. I mean, mostly done by PhD students. And, but these were, I was lucky to have these two postdocs who helped a lot uh, in my initial stage. Uh, she happened to be my own wife. <laughs> so, so if you can manage to have your wife or husband working in your lab, it's going to be quite good. Uh, but there are little, some hurdles, uh, which uh, if you wanted to know, uh, yeah, but she helped me a lot. But now she's an in independent investigator uh, elsewhere. And Kishore, uh, he was quite good. And then uh, she was a project assistant. I mean, these are some of the people who made a big difference with respect to my lab growth. Then um, coming to publications. I mean, yesterday we just talked about publications and impact and all those kind of things. See, at the end of the day, I believe that publication is going to be the measure which is going to come up at different levels. Even when you go for your job, forget about that, even when you go for your postdoc, they will look at your CV, what you have done, right? And that is true for uh, your job applications, promotions, wherever you go. So there is no escape from publications and, and it's important to have quality publication. So that's where you know, we are getting mixed up with uh, quality, with the impact and other things. I won't go into those, uh, but the point is obviously publications are the measure of an individual's discoveries because you can have big big discovery this is not uh, that maybe 200 years back where you know even if you don't publish one day see it's not like that so now there are everywhere everything so you need to publish in a place uh, where visibility is there which is very important see uh, difficult to come at the initial stages um, again don't get frustrated because you know you will we may have to submit multiple places sometime but as long as you know the story is good the good when i say uh, you know, the, your finding is correct. It's okay, even if you are not able to go to the place where you wanted to, it's okay, like go, you know, little down, wherever. Uh, but try to find a place, um, as much as possible, a visible place where people read the papers. See, there are many journals these days, like thousands of journals, many journals nobody reads. So, but, but you also know that which are the journals, you know, generally people look at. So try to look for that. There are a few other information, I'll just skip those. And uh, early publication, even if it's small, I think it boosts your confidence <coughs> as a young investigator. Because you may be coming from a big lab, but then now you are your own. Right? It's a different ball game. And uh, if you are particularly coming back to India, see there are little more added difficulties too. Okay? It's a fact. But then you know, nothing is impossible. Wherever you are, you can always do good research if you want it. So that's the uh, big thing. And then uh, the early publications, the another advantage is, you know, it, it motivates your own students. Even students will have, you know, develop confidence. And then it, it also helps future find funding. So like, especially if you don't have a DBT welcome, see there, the funding is for five years. So you are safe. I mean, I think there, are, there is also very strict evaluation there. Uh, but even when you have a small funding, see, if you have to get more other funding, you need to, you know, start doing something. So that will help you, even if it's a small publication. And then I believe collaborations are very important. And uh, as told yesterday, uh, selecting collaborators are, you know, you have to be very, you know, you have to be very careful. You don't want everybody as your collaborator, which way, that means nothing, you are no, going nowhere. See, the important thing is you need to choose the right collaborators and especially people with different expertise. And I'll show you one of the examples today I'm going to show will illustrate that point. And then, in my opinion, countries should not be a barrier. Because science is beyond, uh, you know, territories and uh, things like that. So, um, but 
there is a little thing I put here in a red color, but unfortunately, I don't agree with this particular opinion, but it's a, some extent it's fa fact. Unfortunately, sometimes collaborations may become a negative factor for young investigators when being judged for performance, although I don't endorse this. Hmm. Okay, so um, I think I took about um, 15 minutes, so I have uh, 15 minutes more, I suppose. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to shift gear a little bit. Uh, so that was some of the experience and my, some of my own thoughts. And uh, as, as, I, uh, as I said, um, you, know, you know, it's up to you to um, you know, take whatever you wanted and uh, trash the rest of them. Um, so now I'm just going to tell one of, one of only one story uh, wherein we made an important uh, contribution. So this is uh, about an inhibitor, it's a chemical uh, which we have identified against uh, one of the you know, DNA repair pathways, NHG. I'll just tell it as a story, it's not the way we published in the paper, it is already a published paper. Um, so when we started this project, so see, I mean I think by this time you understood that our, my lab work on NHG. So we, we were working on a particular DNA repair pathway and then we got hold of a we think we got hold of a new something new, uh, which in which a particular protein called ligase four, I mean it's a ligase, um, is involved. So we are looking for ligase inhibitors for a particular uh, for this work. Um, so one of the labs from abroad had that. So we wrote to the investigator. I don't take the names, but although everything is there uh, everywhere. But uh, unfortunately, they did not share. Uh, the, uh, the reagents. Initially my PhD student wrote and then later I wrote but we never got a reply. So I would think that they never received the mail. But whatever it is we never got even after multiple uh, requests. Um, so fortunately I had this uh, collaborations wherein we uh, you know work with uh, many uh, small molecule uh, the area of uh, which I kind of introduced already where we try to work, work on small molecule inhibitors. So I told this in, uh, collaborator, one of my chemistry collaborator, see this, see everything is known, the, you know, it's a paper is published, the one with the inhibitor which we wanted. So I asked him, why don't you make this inhibitor for us? And uh, they happily said yes. And then after like two weeks, he came with this chemical and then said, see here is the inhibitor. Um, so that's where, uh, she's Mrinal Srivastava. She was the one who did uh, almost all this work which I'm going to tell, about at least 80% of the work what I'm going to tell. So she is she's a special student because she has a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and uh, anything you tell, uh, you know, by next day or next day, next day you'll see, uh, you know, she'll come up with the result. So we got this inhibitor, and we have this DNA repair assay, which was standardized long time back, uh, wherein you can measure the efficiency of NHEJ. So now, what is NHEJ? It's you know joining of DNA double strand breaks. So it's joining of broken DNA like end to end joining. So now if you have two broken DNA like say two DNA molecule once it join you will have a double sized fragment like a dimer and three trimer and multimers. So if you run on a gel after the joining you will be able to visualize that. So you will have a substrate and then if, if it's DNA repair takes place there will be two, three, four and uh, like that molecules. So now uh, what she did is she took this inhibitor and uh, tested in this assay and then she found okay perfect this we got the inhibitor because it, it blocked the NHEJ. So we were very happy. Uh, but then the bad thing happened after a week when um, this my collaborator came back and said that sorry uh, we give you see he tricked us actually some extent. See he, he did the initial purification of the molecule and all those things. But he, he gave this molecule for characterization like NMR, uh, mass spec and all those things. And uh, but that part he did not tell us. So next week he came and told okay sorry this is a wrong molecule. Okay what we got. But then we were very happy by thinking that okay now we can continue with our other project because we got uh, you know the so called uh, ligase inhibitor. So that was very disappointing. And okay, so then after a month, uh, he came back with the correct inhibitor. This time he came with all the characterization, everything. So whatever we wanted. But now what happened is to our surprise, when we uh, tested this inhibitor, uh, what we found is the one which we got accidentally, see that, that is this one is shown here, which is blocking the joining much better than the 
one known in literature. Now, the one known in literature, it was against, see, we have in human mammals, there are three ligases. I'm sure some of you would have heard about ligase 1, ligase 3, and ligase 4. Ligase 1 is normally during, you know, DNA replication, joining of Okasaki fragment and things like that. And 2 and, uh, two and uh, so 3 and uh, 4 is mostly dedicated for DNA repair. So now, this other inhibitor which was already known was against all three ligases. But still we thought, you know, at some concentration uh, they said it worked against ligase 4, so we wanted to test. But now, what happened is, accidentally we got this uh, molecule which was showing, uh, you know, you can see it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a better uh, compared to other one. So at that time, you know, this happened somewhere around 2008-9. So that means I was like three years after joining my dependent lab. I thought, okay, fine, you know, already there is an inhibitor, now you are getting one more, you know, how much? So I did not show much interest uh, and we just that molecule for about six months. Because we had many such kind of molecule, I mean, not DNA repair inhibitor, many other inhibitors which we were working on. But then uh, the interesting th thing happened after about six months when we were testing uh, some other molecule for its anti-cancer property in animals. I told uh, one of my students, I mean, in fact, Maranal itself, why don't you put this in the, you know, also test, just for curiosity. So what we found was something interesting. If you look at here, after 25 days of treatment, uh, so this is a tumor control. I mean, you can see there's a little reduction, but if you leave this animal for a long time in the control, the tumor is grown uh, quite efficiently. And whereas uh, if you put SCR7, that chemical is called SCR7, and then uh, you, don't find, uh, you don't find much tumor. So now this is a cumulative uh, data. If you look at here, uh, on zero -th day, see, uh, the green is after ACR7 treatment and the other one is controlled. So X axis, the tumor, uh, the number of days and Y axis uh, tumor volume. So with increase in number of days, you can see the tumor uh, size is grown. If you don't treat with ACR7, but if you treat, uh, it's kind of affected. Essentially, uh, what we come up with is, uh, is an inhibitor which can target like this for, and which worked inside the cells, and it could it uh, result in accumulation of DNA breaks, which means endogenous DNA repair is blocked, and it induces cytotoxicity, and we tested in many cancer cell lines, and we tested in uh, four tumor models, and uh, three cases it worked, and one did not. And then obviously we went for publications, you know, as usual rejections and things like that. Uh, but most important finding from this study was, this happened to be one of those inhibitors uh, which can potentiate the effect of radio and chemotherapy. And this work was published in Cell about three years back. The lesson from this uh, whole thing is, see we ourselves had a lot of expertise with respect to DNA repair. Uh, but then a group of bioinformaticians, chemists, and imaging people came together uh, to make sure that this work go to the next level. Okay. So uh, obviously, uh, choosing right uh, right uh, collaborators are uh, very important. And this molecule is patented, commercially sold, and so on. And one of the very interesting thing, maybe we got again lucky, wherein uh, recently uh, three independent groups showed that ACR7 can potentiate the ACR7 can improve the CRISPR-Cas mediated genome editing up to uh, some 1920 fold. And this was published by other groups and then people are using it as a biochemical inhibitors. And this generated a lot of interest, several companies are selling now. So that way uh, our molecule has become uh, popular. I think this is kind of, uh, I kind of already referred. So this is some of the suggestions I thought I want to give. We can anyway discuss, I mean, I'll be there. And this, essentially you have to have, you know, lab meeting and things like that. And uh, as much as possible, don't try to submit your paper in a hurry, you know, try to develop it as a big story if you can and if your time permits and the students are okay with that. And, uh, you know, discipline is something very important if you want to grow. And then a conducive lab environment is uh, uh, another uh, important thing. And then keep in mind, uh, see, whatever research we do, especially if you, if you are managing with the PhD students, um, you know, try to respect the time, that's something very important. And then always try to be a role model for your students and if you expect your student to do well and first you make sure that you yourself is, you know, putting your 100% effort. And once you do that, your students will follow and uh, this is the last slide and uh, my group members, collaborators and uh, funding agencies and thank you very much. And I think I did not take five minutes, I took less than that. Thank you.